Hidden in the silent faces of Egyptian monuments, under the gaze of the Vedic gods, between the lines of the old books of alchemy and tantalizing us from the myths of the Aztecs and Mayans, the essence of the secret doctrine has always been there. Throughout the history of humanity, only the elect few were initiated into the mysteries of this great universal truth. And those few guided the rest of humanity and gave them the outward symbols of that truth as guidance. For the great arcanum, the secret of secrets, was fiercely protected and offered only to those who had proven their moral purity and trustworthiness. But as humanity degenerated into barbarism and cruelty, the divine knowledge went underground to survive in isolated pockets around the world. For many centuries, the great arcanum has been beckoning to humanity from behind the stories and myths that veil it. The knowledge it delivers is universal and applies to all true religions and mystical traditions. Whether it is the serpent of Adam and Eve from the Judeo-Christian tradition, the winged serpent of Quetzalcoatl from the Aztec tradition, the serpents climbing the caduceus of the Greek god Hermes, or the serpents of the Hindu or Buddhist traditions, all these symbols contain the same teaching. At long last, after centuries of darkness and ignorance, the time has come for this hidden doctrine to be revealed. are precious jewels on the golden string of divinity. The word religion derives from the Latin root re ligare, which means union. The word yoga is derived from the Sanskrit root yug, which also means union. At their base, the different traditions of East and West describe the same goal, union with divinity. Religious traditions provide the map that one must follow in order to reach unification with the divine. Every religion seeks to express the same core knowledge. But one needs the right tools in order to read the map. With the right tools and their proper use, an aspirant of any religion or tradition may enter into direct experiential knowledge of the divine. It can be seen then that there is truly one science, one path, but appearing with different names and faces. 
For narrow is the gate, and straightened the way that leads to life, and they are few who find it. In Greek, the narrow path is called gnosis, which means knowledge. In Hebrew, the same narrow path is called da'at, which also means knowledge. This path is represented by the famous tree of knowledge in the book of Genesis. And the clue to entering into the direct experience of God can be found through understanding the symbol of the tree of knowledge. Genesis, the Judeo-Christian teaching of creation, was written as a means to pass down the knowledge of the great arcanum to those with the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Its inception was influenced by both Eastern and Western traditions in order to provide humanity a key contained in the foundation of all the great religions of the world. The Old Testament, or Tanakh, outwardly appears to be basic spiritual instruction in the form of stories and histories. Yet in truth, it is a vehicle of the secret knowledge. To better understand the origins of the Judeo-Christian tradition of Genesis, it is necessary to take a brief look at the life of the author, Moses. Although of Jewish lineage, Moses was raised to be an Egyptian pharaoh and was trained in not only the hidden wisdom of Egypt, but also that of his native Judaism. The civilization of ancient Egypt is among the longest lasting in the history of humanity and an accepted custodian of immense knowledge in the ancient world. Judaism was directly influenced by two of the oldest civilizations on record, those of Sumeria and Babylonia, civilizations famous for their mystery schools. Schooled in the hidden teachings of these ancient traditions, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible in Hebrew and in code, as was the tradition. Thus, every story and name contained within the books of Moses hides a deeper meaning. As it says in the mystical Hebrew book, the Zohar, the narratives of the doctrine are its cloak. The simple look only at the garment, that is, upon the narrative of the doctrine. More they know not. The instructed, however, see not merely the cloak, but what the cloak covers. The Bible is symbolic. The characters and events of the Bible are a cloak that veils the real message. This inner knowledge has been hidden or in the case of Christianity, rejected entirely. The Bible, like all great religious books, has been interpreted literally. Even Jesus of Nazareth taught both a public and a secret doctrine. To you it hath been given to know the secrets of the reign of the heavens, and to these it hath not been given. Those who received the secret teaching were persecuted and forced to take the knowledge underground. As a result, the modern church has inherited merely the cloak. In addition, the Bible has undergone repeated editing by those without any knowledge of its secrets. Although the modern Bible is greatly disfigured, it is nevertheless infused with the ancient secret doctrine. However, the many levels of meaning hidden in the Hebrew letters are not visible in the modern language versions of the Bible. For example, the very first words of the Bible in Hebrew are Bereshit bara Elohim. The common literal translation is in the beginning, God creates. But the Hebraic translation found in the Zohar reads, in wisdom, Elohim creates. Elohim 
is a Hebrew word. The root El is Hebrew for God and is masculine. The feminine form of El is Eloah, which means goddess. Elohim is plural, thus meaning gods and goddesses, male, female. In contrast to the familiar image of a bearded old man, God is established in the first three words of the Bible as androgynous, containing both male and female. The word Elohim has many meanings. In one sense, it refers to angels, the governors of creation. These divine beings are male-female, in the image of their creator. This is clearly illustrated in most ancient images of angels, showing them to have the attributes of both man and woman. In the Bible, the angel who oversaw the creation of humanity is called Jehovah Elohim. Jehovah Elohim formed man from the dust of the earth. He blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Jehovah is another important name of God, not to be confused with Javeh. The name Jehovah or Jehovah is comprised of four Hebrew letters, Yod, He, Vau, He. Yod or Yah can be translated as male or phallus, Adam. Heva or Heve is female, mother or uterus, Eve. Even the name Jehovah contains both masculine and feminine forces. God created man in his own image. In the image of Elohim created he them. Male and female created he them. The Elohim, the angel, Jehovah, formed man in his image, androgynous. And so, as recorded in the esoteric heart of all great religions, humanity, symbolized by Adam, was once androgynous, containing both male and female. Jehovah Elohim planted a garden in Eden in the east and placed there the man whom he had formed. Eden is a paradise of perfection. Eden is symbolic of the innocence and happiness that was once the natural state of humanity. The humanity of Eden was pure, knowing only goodness and virtue. As reflections of God, humanity embodied the seven virtues of the soul. Although the Eden of Adam and Eve never existed in the three-dimensional physical world, according to esoteric wisdom, there was a physical place called Eden that was located in Mesopotamia between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. A mystery school by the same name was founded in this place by the Chaldeans. But this was not the Garden of Eden of Adam and Eve. According to esoteric wisdom, there exist seven fundamental dimensions. Do you not know how Allah has created the seven heavens, one above the other? The ascent and descent through these realms by the beings that inhabit them is represented in the Bible by Jacob's Ladder. The Bible states that when Jehovah Elohim created Adam, he placed Adam in the Garden of Eden. 
Esoteric wisdom states that this is the fourth dimension, the world of vital energy. In Hebrew, it is called Yasad, which means the foundation. Thus, the androgynous ancestor of humanity existed in a more subtle level of nature. That is why modern anthropologists know nothing about our true origins. Though happy in its innocence, humanity, as symbolized by Adam, needed to grow spiritually. Thus Eve was separated from the body of Adam. Jehovah Elohim took one of the hermaphrodite man's ribs, then closed up the flesh. Then Jehovah Elohim made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the hermaphrodite man. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of the man. This process of separation presented symbolically in the Bible was gradual. The human hermaphrodite was separated into two sexes, male and female, so that they may see themselves better, to know themselves. Since that time, man and woman have sought to reclaim their missing unity, which is the root of the craving for sexual connection. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And out of the ground made Jehovah Elohim to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, with the tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There are two trees that are given specific importance within the garden. These two trees are symbolic, not literal. The tree of life is an ancient symbol that is universal in meaning and is found in all the cultures that have held the esoteric knowledge. This is the same tree that Moses found burning on Mount Sinai. This is the tree under which the Buddha Shakyamuni found enlightenment. This is the world tree of the Mayans, the tree of life of the Aztecs, the great Nordic tree, Yggdrasil, that supports existence in its powerful boughs. In the mystical tradition of Judaism, the science of the tree of life is called Kabbalah. But this wisdom is universal and can be found in every great religious tradition, although it appears under many names. The science of the tree of life is a map of the universe and of the human soul. Just as the tree of life maps the macrocosmos, the expansive universe, so too does it map the microcosmos, man, the reflection of the universe. Thus the wise recommendation etched in stone above the entrance to the famous oracle of Delphi. Man, know thyself, and thou shalt know the universe and its gods. The tree of life symbolizes the structure of the soul and the structure of creation. Its roots are in the highest realms and its branches and leaves are all the worlds and the many beings that exist. This tree gives forth fruit, life, sustenance, and wisdom. In the Bible, Moses wrote that Adam and Eve were free to eat of the tree of life. This means that Adam and Eve were free to feed themselves with the science of the tree of life, the science of God, Kabbalah. And as the tree of life also symbolizes the soul, Adam and Eve, humanity, were allowed to enjoy the benefits of abiding in a state of perfection with an awakened consciousness. A fully illuminated consciousness is represented in the tradition of the Christmas tree, a symbol of the tree of life as passed down through Germanic esoteric traditions. Possessing an illuminated tree of life within 
means that one's inner senses are fully opened and active, providing a direct relationship with God. Of this tree, Adam and Eve could freely eat. But there existed another tree in Eden, the tree of knowledge. And Jehovah Elohim commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you are free to eat. But as for the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you must not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. It is clear that the tree of knowledge was forbidden to Adam and Eve, yet they were tempted by the one thing in all of paradise that was denied to them. Knowledge in Greek is gnosis, and in Hebrew, da'at. Da'at is the hidden sphere found in the Kabbalah, which traditionally is never spoken of or revealed. Da'at, gnosis, is the science of the great arcanum, that secret knowledge which has been hidden from humanity for ages. However, close examination of the use of the word knowledge in the Bible gives strong indications of the nature of dot or gnosis. Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son. The maiden was very beautiful, a virgin who no man had known. It is clear to the observant reader that knowledge in the Bible relates to sexuality. Hence, the tree of knowledge, da'at, gnosis, is a direct reference to sexuality. What then is the purpose of this reference to sex and its role in the fate of Adam and Eve? When humanity was physically separated into two sexes, man and woman still carried within them the reflection of their creator. Thus, within every male, there still exists a female aspect, and within every woman exists a male aspect. By this level of meaning, Adam and Eve symbolize the subtle energetic physiology of the individual. Adam and Eve as polarized energy are represented in the ancient symbol of the caduceus, popularly associated to the Greek god Hermes. The symbol of the caduceus is actually visible in the records of countless ancient cultures from around the world. The two serpents have always symbolized the masculine and feminine energetic channels that wind up the spinal column. As they are energetic, not physical, a scalpel will never find them. Their root is yasad, the foundation, the sexual organs, and they are fed by the sexual energy. These two channels of energy are called Ida and Pingala in Sanskrit. In the Kabbalah, they are called Od and Ob, and in esoteric Christianity, they are called Adam and Eve. In the Bible, they are also called the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. The two serpents wind up the spinal column of the physical body. The spine is most often symbolized by a staff or a rod, The spine is the staff of the master and the central column of the human temple. The column stands upon the foundation stone, Yasad, the sexual energy. The spine has 33 vertebrae, symbolized by the 33 years of the life of Jesus of Nazareth and by the 33 degrees of the Masons. On either side of this rod, 
the spinal column are two serpents. Pingala is the masculine aspect, Adam. Ida is the feminine aspect, Eve. It is the energy of Eve in our psyche that pushes for procreation. When Eve is tempted to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, this is a symbol of humanity desiring the fruit of sexuality, children. Until this time, humanity was not allowed to have children on their own. They were not allowed to eat that fruit. And the serpent said to the woman, you are not going to die, but the Elohim know that as soon as you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like divine beings who know good and bad. Tempted by the serpent, human beings chose to procreate of their own will. In their innocence, however, they did not realize that the laws they were given were for their own good. Learning to procreate without the guidance of the Elohim led to the discovery of the orgasm. The tree of knowledge or sexuality was present alongside all the other aspects of existence. It is even recognized as an important presence in Eden, alongside the tree of life. And in the tradition of the Kabbalah, these two trees are said to share the same roots. However, unlike any other tree in Eden, Adam and Eve were only allowed to enjoy the tree of knowledge without indulging in its fruit. For as soon as you eat of it, you shall die. While in Eden, Adam and Eve only knew divinity and innocence, and thus inherently respected the laws of creation. In their innocence, they were ignorant of the consequences of indulging in the fruit of sexuality. Tremendous energy is harnessed in the sexual act between a man and a woman. It is in this coitus that humanity has the God-given capacity to create. Man is the active force, the reflection of God the Father. Woman as the receptive force, the reflection of God the Mother. And sex as the force that brings them together. These are the three forces that give rise to all of creation. And this is the foundation of the universal symbol of the Trinity. The Trinity is a unity of three, three that express as one. But in order to create, this one divides itself in two, male and female. This is the mystery of the Holy Spirit, the fecundating fire of God, symbolized in India as Shiva Shakti, the creative and destructive power of God. One of the most sacred symbols of Shiva, the Holy Spirit, is the Lingam Yoni, the intersection of the phallus and uterus. The same symbol is found on the other side of the world in the alchemical tradition. The force that powers all creation on all levels of existence is sexual energy. Sexual energy is symbolized by fire, by water, and by light.
In the tradition of alchemy, the sexual energy is symbolized by mercury. When we strike upon the foundation stone, the rock, we find the waters of life. The ancient ritual of baptism is a symbol of the transmutation of sexual energy, the source of salvation. All of life is born of the sexual waters. The power of creation, harnessing the force of that electric energy, implies a great responsibility. At the time of Adam and Eve, sex was only practiced in the temples under the guidance of the Elohim. Gabriel and his legions of angels were guiding humanity in this holy ritual, as indicated by his recurrence in the Bible announcing the arrival of children. Gabriel is the regent of the moon and directly influences all forms of conception. At certain times of the year, the husband and wife would travel long distances in order to be instructed in the sexual mysteries. This is the long forgotten root of the modern practice of the honeymoon. Thus the angels supervised this holy sacrament and guided a single sperm to meet an egg in the precise moment needed to engender a deliberate and divine child. The wasteful expulsion of energy and semen through the orgasm was not and is not required to create a child. This is, in fact, the hidden meaning of the term immaculate conception. Immaculate means perfectly clean. When a man has an emission of semen, he shall bathe his whole body in water and remain unclean until evening. To indulge in the fruit of sexuality means to spill the sexual energy, to orgasm, to taste the divine energy that illuminates the soul in order to feel physical sensation. Thus the energy used to maintain the physical and spiritual vitality of the individual is expelled through the orgasm. Adam and Eve, as a symbol of men and women of the ancient past, ate of the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge or the secret knowledge of sexuality. They abused the sexual energy in their own bodies by having the orgasm. And therefore, they broke the most fundamental rule they had been given. It is very important that the tremendous energy that gives mankind the ability to create be used efficiently because it is connected to the same energetic force that sustains the individual's own vitality. It is well known that the sexual energy is intimately related to the health of our psyche and our physical bodies. Not only is it necessary for sustaining physical vitality and thus the five physical senses, but also the vitality of the seven superior senses that unites mankind to the divine. Without the sexual energy, the soul atrophies, breaking our connection with God. When we expel the sexual energy, we expel the energy that fuels our inner senses. This is why those who fornicate, who expel the sexual energy through the orgasm, cannot perceive God directly. The orgasm is symbolized in the poisoned apple given to Snow White. While sweet to the taste of the physical senses, it is poison to the soul. Eating it results in unconsciousness and an eternity of sleep.
The universal story of maidens and virtuous heroes falling asleep is an allegory illustrating the sleep of the consciousness. The state in which the human being loses the direct personal knowledge of God and the higher realms of nature. This is why the fruit of the tree of knowledge was forbidden to eat. Before the abuse of the tree of knowledge, sex was treated with the utmost respect and the orgasm was unknown to mankind and unnecessary. Husband joined wife in the sexual act according to the laws given to them by Jehovah Elohim. They enjoyed the tree of knowledge, sexuality, but did not eat of its fruit. This was the genesis of the distinction between good and evil. A humanity that knew only goodness ate of the forbidden fruit and discovered animal desire, which always leads to suffering and pain. This is the Pandora's box or vase of Greek mythology, which when opened, releases the agents of evil into the world. Fear, pride, shame. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And Adam said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Through the discovery of the orgasm, Adam learned to be afraid, to be ashamed. As promised by the tempting serpent, humanity gained new knowledge, the knowledge of suffering. In tasting the forbidden fruit, Adam learned desire. From this moment, right and wrong is filtered subjectively through the need to feel pleasure and avoid suffering. And Jehovah Elohim said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. Humanity had already known good, innocence, purity, and simplicity. Now humanity also knew evil, shame, fear, pain, emptiness. Now humanity knew what the Elohim knew, that desire leads to suffering. Desire caused all the gods to fall from their places and it is desire that leads all creatures to hell. Desire is craving, and craving is suffering. Desire always leads to suffering. This is the message that is inherent in every great religion. The slave of desire is a slave of sin, and only suffering and death await him. Through the abandonment of desire, the deathless state is realized. Thus, stripped of their connection to the divine, Adam and Eve, as symbols of humanity, were cast out of Eden to wander in a wilderness of suffering and ignorance. And to the woman, he said, I will make most severe your pains in childbirth. In pain shall you bear children. Rejecting the laws of Jehovah and the guidance of the Elohim, humanity attempted to have children on its own. And in the end, conception and childbirth happened out of balance with nature. And the result was pain and hardship. By using the sexual force to stimulate desire, the fire of Eve became inverted, flowing in the opposite direction. The serpent fell, forming the famous tale of Satan, stimulating the seven inverted virtues, the seven capital sins.
exists within every soul that is united with God. Expelling the light of God from within expels the soul from Eden and creates a great emptiness. To replace the void created by this disconnection with God, mankind created civilizations, ideas, and religions, seeking material wealth, power, and sexual satisfaction. Desire for sensation became the new God and only served to further degenerate mankind until man was left with only a trace of the divine inside. The secret knowledge contained in the story of Adam and Eve can be found hidden in mythological and religious stories from around the world. In story after story are found the enlightened or empowered heroes brought to ruin by their lust. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, long hair was the symbol of sexual purity or chastity. Thus, when Delilah cuts the hair of Samson, this is a symbol of lustful seduction. Samson lost his power when he could not control his sexual desire. In the epic Indian classic, the Mahabharata, the immortal Pandu is warned never to release the sexual energy. But when tempted by a beautiful woman, he proves incapable of controlling his lust and he throws away his immortality and dies. By expelling the sexual energy, humanity lost their inner senses and were no longer able to perceive God directly. Thus, when humanity willingly expelled the subtle energies that supported a direct relationship with God, it was simultaneously cast out of Eden, the paradise of the fourth dimension and mankind descended into the wilderness, the physical world, this third dimension, the world of suffering. He drove the man out and stationed east of the Garden of Eden, the Cherubim and the fiery ever-turning sword to guard the way to the Tree of Life. Adam and Eve were cast out of Eden. However, the gateway back to Eden and the Tree of Life was neither closed nor locked. Instead, Jehovah Elohim sent a cherubim with a flaming sword to guard the entrance. The entrance to the Garden of Eden is the same door through which Adam and Eve departed. Humanity is not locked out of Eden, but a cherubim is left to grant entrance only to those whom have earned the right to return, and only those whom have conquered the tempting serpent have earned that right. If you bring forth what is within you, what is within you will save you. But if you do not bring forth what is within you, what is within you will destroy you. The serpent is within. The serpent is the sexual fire. It is a very powerful atomic energy with a polarity that can be used either to create or to destroy. Because this energy is so powerful, the individual requires great willpower in order to overcome the lure of this serpent. The temptation of this serpent is through material pleasure and self-edification. This tempting aspect of the serpent is Lucifer, or what in Hebrew is called Shaitan, the enemy. Because Shaitan is a fiery serpent that is ignited and empowered through the sexual act, it is always tempting mankind to know to have the sexual connection. The serpent itself is power. The individual decides through their actions whether it will be a power of good or evil. It is the difference between obeying the serpent or controlling it. 
The lesson contained in the story of the serpent is that only those with the strength of will to control the cravings of their mind can raise the energetic serpent to transform themselves from intellectual animals into true human beings. It is necessary to conquer the dragon that lies within, as religions and mystical traditions have told for endless ages. The dragon is one's own lust, passion, anger, pride, fear, and envy. Thus exists the hydra of many heads and the medusa. The deceptions of the serpent are legion. The great heroes and gods always have the serpent under their power. And it is the serpent who protects them and conquers their enemies. In contrast to the serpent that tempted Eve, causing her to fall, there is the serpent of Moses, who commanded its power and conquered the Egyptians, accomplishing great miracles. The Egyptians had degenerated into black magic, and Moses appeared to deliver the true teachings. The Hebrew Mem signifies water, Shin is fire, and He is the womb. So the name Moshe or Moses means born of water and fire. The Aztec Christ, Quetzalcoatl, and the Tibetan Padmasambhava were also both born of the waters. Unless a man be born again of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Moses was born again, which means that he created the soul, symbolized by the illuminated tree of life, the burning bush that he saw in the wilderness. The enlightened tree unified him with his inner father, Thus, he received the commands of God directly. Moses needed to free the people of Israel from Egypt. Egypt represents the degenerated mind of man, and the Pharaoh is the tyrant that jealousy rules over this man-made civilization of material power and desire. Israel is a compound word. Is is from Isis, the Egyptian divine mother. Ra is the Egyptian divine father. And El is Hebrew for God. So when the nation of Israel is trapped in slavery, this is a symbol of one's own inner divinity trapped within the degenerated mind. Moses was told to take the rod, the spinal column, the tree of life in his own body, and it became a serpent the serpent of the Kundalini. His serpent was more powerful than the negative serpent of the Egyptians. Thus, this story symbolizes the duality of the sexual force. Only the positive serpent under the service of God can free the soul from suffering. This is clearly represented in Egyptian art. The positive serpent protects while the negative serpent must be dominated and conquered. Sex can be lustful or chaste. Sex can create or destroy. Sex can be animal or worshipful. Sex can raise a fiery chariot to God or pave a road to the abyss. Sex is the natural function of the human being, but only sex as performed under the guidance of divine will. Sex performed under the guidance of the mind creates suffering, pain, and spiritual death. This is self-evident in those who seek happiness in sex. As with any desire of the mind, sexual desire can never be satisfied. 
Desire is never satisfied by the enjoyment of lust, just as fire surely increases the more one gives it fuel. And the serpent said to the woman, You are not going to die, but the Elohim know that as soon as you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like divine beings who know good and bad. Whether the individual is in love or lust, the serpent is powerful because all of the blood is circulating with that fire within the body. And when two people unite sexually, the internal polarity is balanced and enhanced. A tremendous energy is excited that permeates the couple with the power to create. This is the fire of the Holy Spirit, as demonstrated by the tongues of fire raised above the apostles. This is the Hebrew character Shin, which represents the fire of God, the fire of the Holy Spirit, and the fire of the Christ. Shin, with its three points, embodies the three forces of creation. In this connection, the couple is appreciating the tree of knowledge, to know. To conquer the desire for the orgasm is to conquer the tempting serpent of Eve. As the serpent is always on the tree of knowledge of good and evil, this is the only place to conquer it and gain true knowledge through sexuality. When you unite male and female into one, then you will enter into the kingdom. The kingdom in Hebrew is Malkut. This is the first sephira on the tree of life. It is where the real work physically begins as man and wife. Humanity left Eden as a couple, and as a couple they must return. This is illustrated in the ancient acknowledgement of the need for both priest and priestess, the couple that must work together in order to reach perfection. Couples that conquer the desire to eat the fruit of knowledge internally gather up all of that energy. And gradually that energy can be used to create something within. Rather than feeding their own lust, they can restore their own inner Eve the fallen serpent. And from there, they may then raise the serpent of the Kundalini. They can illuminate the tree of life, which exists within the human body, the spinal column. And they can create divine light within themselves and return to the direct knowledge of their own inner God. This is why all of the world's great religions emphasize chastity. Chastity does not mean abstention from sex. It means abstention from the orgasm, from spilling the divine energy that is the Holy Spirit. The sexual act performed in the usual way may give a slight notion of the nature of this higher consciousness. But more than that, it cannot do, since the energy, instead of being trapped and put into use, is expended, creating a new physical body instead of spiritual consciousness. Sex is not only important for spiritual advancement, it is a necessity. It is through sexual energy that the vehicle of the human soul is born. This is what is meant when the biblical Jesus explains to Nicodemus that he must be born again. Unless a man be born again of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He must give birth internally to his soul from the water and the Holy Spirit. With patience ye shall possess thy souls. Jesus of Nazareth never said that the soul already exists within a man. Instead, he said it must be born of the water and the spirit. In all of creation, everything is born of sex. 
Thus, the soul, the fiery chariot of heaven, must also be born of sex. The soul must be born within a person, born of the waters of sex and the fire of the spirit. When Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, he told her of a water that gives eternal life. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I may not thirst, nor come hither to draw. Jesus saith to her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. He was prepared to tell her the secret of alchemy, the great arcanum. That secret, allegorized in countless ancient stories, is that the waters of eternal life, the fountain of youth, is developed between husband and wife in chastity. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. She was not faithful to one man, and thus she was not prepared to receive the true teaching. But a man who commits adultery lacks judgment. Whoever does so destroys himself. Jesus taught the path that he practiced, the path of the perfect matrimony. A perfect matrimony requires an alchemical marriage between man and wife. And the companion of the Savior was Mary Magdalene. He loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on her mouth. For various causes, such direct references to Jesus' intimate relationship with his wife were edited out of the Christian doctrine. But the writers of the Bible anticipated such adulterations of the text and veiled the true teachings in symbols and allegory. So although Jesus' marital relationship with Mary Magdalene was removed, the teaching has been maintained that his first miracle was at a wedding feast in which he celebrated the marriage of a man and wife by transmuting water into a delicious wine, a miracle of alchemy that can only exist within the perfect matrimony. The Hebrew character Shin is the symbol for fire. It is very revealing to see that when man and woman, Adam, Yod, and Eve, Heve, are joined through the sexual fire, the character Shin, the result is Yeshua, Jesus, the Savior. Likewise, Christ is derived from the Greek root krestos, whose esoteric meaning is fire. The term Jesus Christ is not a personal name. It is a title, Yeshua Christos, meaning Savior, fire. I am the way. Jesus of Nazareth, by working intensely with his wife, incarnated the fire of the Christ, as did Moses and many others. All of them worked with a spouse. All of them knew and taught the great arcanum. The Christ is a universal energy that saves those who are pure enough to receive it. Man and wife, through immaculate sexuality 
and the grace of God create the Savior, the Christic fire. The containment and transmutation of the potent sexual energy can restore the fallen serpent of Eve. From there, the fire of the Holy Spirit can be awakened, raising the serpent upon the staff. This is the Kundalini, the positive, life-giving serpent. It can only be awakened through chastity and only by husband and wife. A single person cannot awaken the Kundalini. The Kundalini is not a blind mechanical force. It is the active intelligence of God and can only manifest within those who purify themselves of all that is against God, pride, envy, lust, greed, etc. The fire of the Kundalini awakens only with moral progress. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The revelation of St. John explains what is necessary in order to return to heaven. But the answer is deliberately veiled in symbolism and metaphors. That is why so few understand this book. It is said that 144,000 will be saved and taken to heaven. This number is symbolic. Every Hebrew letter also represents a number. The letters that spell Adam also give the numbers 1, 4, and 40. Thus the meaning is that only those who have restored the innocence of Adam within themselves will return to Eden. Likewise, when we Kabbalistically add the numbers of the name of Adam, the result is nine. The Sephira, Yasad, or the foundation, the sexual energy. The secret to becoming the perfect Adam is in the ninth sphere. The fire of the sexual energy must create, or it will destroy. This very potent energy cannot be contained, and if repressed, will seek expression destructively, internally through the mind, through anger, or through sexual degeneration. This is evidenced by the infamous perversions of priests around the world, in all religions and the rampant fanaticism that has destroyed so many spiritual movements. In order to utilize the sexual energy effectively, it must be transmuted into spiritual energy. This is accomplished by connecting sexually with the spouse without spilling the energy through the orgasm. Or if one is single, learning to control the energy through ancient methods long forgotten by contemporary priests in the Western traditions. Adam must be born from the sexual water and the fire of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, there cannot be a return to Eden. No one whose testes are crushed or whose member is cut off shall be admitted into the congregation of Jehovah. Entrance back into Eden, the congregation of the Lord, is through the proper use of sexuality. Likewise, the entrance into suffering and pain is through the improper use of sexuality. Sex can be used to create good within a person, or it can be used to create evil. It is the choice of the individual to serve the virgin or the whore. One cannot serve two masters. Love and lust can never mix. God cannot mix with the devil. This is symbolized by the sixth card of the tarot, indecision. 
one chooses his path by his actions. The Great Arcanum is the secret knowledge of Tantra. There are three types of Tantrism, black, gray, and white. Stimulation of sexual sensation and identification with lust is black Tantra. Any school or religion that teaches how to awaken the consciousness through having the orgasm is teaching black Tantra. Black Tantra is responsible for all of the suffering of humanity. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. The fiery serpents are the inverted serpents of the Kunda buffer. The suffering and pain caused by these serpents are the result of identification and desire. The resulting death of so many Israelites refers to spiritual death. Gray Tantra teaches that one should only orgasm occasionally. This teaching inevitably leads one to Black Tantra. White Tantra always teaches three factors. The elimination of desire, the creation of the soul, and sacrifice for others. All White Tantra teaches to renounce the orgasm. White Tantra, the elimination of desire, is the road back to Eden. Mankind must return to Eden through the same door it exited, through sexuality. Mankind must return to the state of purity and innocence it once had in order to transcend suffering and pain. But first, it is necessary to recognize one's mistakes and then act to change them. This is the definition of true penance. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Suffering is the result of being tempted by the serpent. Anyone who wants to be healed of the damage caused by the tempting serpent must be healed as the Israelites were by the bronze serpent of Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass, that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of bronze, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass, that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of bronze, he lived. Bronze is an alloy of two metals, copper and tin, masculine and feminine. The bronze serpent is created when the two polarities are brought together in purity. This is the great secret knowledge of alchemy, the chemistry of God. The prefix al is from the Arabic word Allah, as in Hebrew, El, which means God. Chem means to fuse or cast a metal. So alchemy is the method to fuse oneself once again with God. You will succeed at it if you take pains to be what you should be, that is to say, pious, gentle, benign, charitable, and God-fearing. White Tantra the path of sanctity and chastity frees the consciousness from the ego, awakening the pristine consciousness, free of all animal desire. Black Tantra, the path of identification and fornication, awakens the consciousness that is trapped in the ego, leaving the soul trapped in suffering. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awaken, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. 
To acquire true spiritual awakening, it is necessary to defy the tempting serpent and raise the fire of the Holy Spirit to create the human soul. This is the key to the ancient mystery of alchemy, to transmute the lead of the ego and desire into the spiritual gold of the consciousness. When the sexual fire of Yasod is elevated through the knowledge of Gnosis, Da'at, the great arcanum, the knowledge of the mystery of mysteries, one can return to the direct knowledge of one's own inner star, the light of the world. And the Elohim said, Let there be light, and there was light. All of existence was created with the light of the cosmic Christ, the fire of the Holy Spirit, the sexual energy. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The darkness of the materialistic mind cannot comprehend the light of the Christ. It is necessary to transcend the mind and awaken the consciousness. Light is necessary to see through the darkness. In order to incarnate light, it is mandatory to transcend the animal desires that fill the mind. Therefore, one must understand and act upon the mystery of Adam and Eve. Enter in through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are they who enter in through it. For narrow is the gate, and straighten the way that leads to life, and they are few who find it.